Hello everyone and welcome to this TCCA Critical Updates webinar. I'm Tony Gray, Chief Executive of TCCA, the global representative body and advocate for open standards for the critical communication sector. Throughout its 25 year history, TCCA has supported and promoted the ETSI TETRA standard and we operate the TETRA interoperability testing and certification program on behalf of the critical communications community worldwide. TETRA continues to dominate the world as the de facto standard for critical voice and short data. For example, so far this year, we've had TETRA projects announced in places such as China for four metros, uh, Germany for the Hamburg Fire Department and Munich, Munich Energy Utility, Mauritius for a metro, Mexico City for the police, Nepal, Poland and Romania for airports, Thailand for a rapid transit system, and the UK for the Highways Authority and various police force upgrades. These of course exclude all those government, military and other secret contracts that don't get publicly announced. Today's TCCA webinar is entitled Tetra to 2035 and Beyond and provides an overview of the Tetra standard and technology, plus the enhancements and extensions that continue to be made. It'll be presented by Brian Murgatroyd and Dave Chater Lee of Etsy TC TCCE, and Yeppe Yepsen, co-vice chair and director of TCCA. We have registered attendees with us from around the world, so we're looking forward to an informative and valuable experience for everyone. Please submit any questions you may have during the course of the webinar using the questions pane on the right-hand side of your screen. If you're on a mobile phone, this appears at the bottom of the screen. If there's time immediately after the presentation, we will answer as many questions as possible immediately, and any that don't get answered during the webinar will be responded to afterwards. Copies of the slides will also be circulated to all attendees after the event. Now I'm pleased to welcome your presenters for today, Brian Murgatroyd, Dave Chater Lee, and Yeppe Epson. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tony, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Brian Murgatroyd, and I chair Etsy Technical Committee, TCCE, which uh, stands for Tetra and Critical Communications Evolution. In this webinar, we've only limited time, and I want to make the aim of the webinar to look at the future for Tetra, but I think it's also worth setting the scene with some background. Let me just get that to work. Excuse me. So the agenda for today, uh, we're going to have a, a quick look at why we believe uh, Tetra has been such a success, followed by as you can see, a marketing overview, then a very important uh, slide on interoperability testing for Tetra. Then I'm going to look at the uh, Tetra, an overview of the Tetra standard, just the structure of that, to look at ongoing developments and actually significant uh, existing developments of the Tetra standard since its inception. Then I'm going to hand over to, uh, uh, to Dave Chater Lee to look at the current developments of which we're going to look at packet data enhancements, security enhancements, into working with critical comms broadband systems, a very important area, and then back to me for conclusions and the future. So why has Tetra been so successful and, and why does it have a long-term future? I think there are many reasons, but here are a few of the most important. First of all, a comprehensive user requirement was made for a true mitigable, a critical, uh, mission critical system that could be used across borders with both voice and data capability, which was spectrally efficient, highly reliable, scalable from single base station to national system, secure, and also had things like set to set um, operation uh, which we call direct mode plus repeater and gateway operation. Secondly, uh, a high quality, I would say that, wouldn't I, as chairman, of uh, uh, open standard uh, 
managed by Etsy, which would ensure interoperability. When we look back um, to before Tetra, mission critical PMR systems were either analog with very, very limited functionality, or they were proprietary digital systems, um, which were very expensive and really were going nowhere, very little prospect of further development. The Tetra standard has been continually refined and developed over the last 25 years. Thirdly, the TCC or TCCA, the Critical Comms Association, this has been absolutely key to Tetra's success. It's provided a platform for users, operators, and industry to help support and develop the technology and to provide an excellent marketing focus. Fourthly, uh, we'll hear more about this later, but in order to prove interoperability between different manufacturers' terminals, and that's what's kept the cost or the price to the users down because there's been good competition, uh, between those terminals and the Tetra infrastructures, we've had a very comprehensive testing regime. So we'll talk about that later. And lastly, and um, really this, this is it really, it's the user or operator who is a final judge of Tetra's fate. And it's their confidence in the longevity of the technology and the support from manufacturers that have ensured Tetra remains at the top of the pack in mission critical systems. Now, I'd like to now hand over to uh, Jeppe Jepsen, who's gonna talk firstly on Tetra marketing, and then secondly, on interoperability testing. Yep. Thank you, Brian. Um, the, the reason why Tetra came about is actually that most countries in Europe had old analog networks uh, for public safety that needed to be replaced. So an MOU and memorandum of understanding was developed between government organizations and the industry to move Tetra standard forward. So the industry promised that they would develop the technology that was being standardized. And the user governments said that if it met their needs, they would do their utmost under the law to procure those technologies in competitive situations. Before that, there was in each country hundreds of standalone analog networks that were not working with each other. And with, we were then able to move from these hundreds of networks to one nationwide network because we had dedicated spectrum in the 380 to 400 in agreement with NATO. So that actually enabled the market for Tetra and it has grown ever since. And when we are looking at the installed base today, we have more than 4 million users. Um, and Europe has more than 50% of that, uh, of that installed base. Um, the growth continues, 2.4%. Uh, you can see here these numbers are from, from ISS uh, market. Um, and um, therefore, uh, they are uh, quite good to know. Uh, Asia Pacific is the second largest region, and then Middle East and Africa. Latin America uh, counts for about 75% of the uh, Americas market. North America, although being the smallest, is forecast to grow by close to 15%. So with that, uh, let's move to the next slide, please, which is about interoperability. And interoperability, I mean, having an open standard is great, but if there is no or only one manufacturer, it doesn't mean anything. What the market actually wants is a multi-vendor situation, and that's what we have enabled with the Tetra standard. Uh, Tetra is a, a trusted uh, technology. It can be built so it's always available and with dedicated coverage and therefore available everywhere where users need it. So the, the multi-vendor supply situation is what the users actually want. They want to have freedom to choose. 
and therefore vendor equipment must work, must work together. Uh, and that's what uh, we have done over the last 20 years uh, in the Tetra Association, which is now TCCA. The, the way we are doing it is that there is something called an interoperability profile, Tetra IOP, where we document in minute details how uh, the protocols shall operate to enable the features and functionality. We have a third party a certification body that oversees what is being done between the companies and they issue a certificate on behalf of the TCCA. And um, as I said, uh, it, it's no good if there's only uh, one company or no company that supports a standard. But here in Tetra, we have 18 companies that participate in the Tetra IOP program. And that's a major reason why we have this success. And over the last 20 years or so, we have issued 179 certificates uh, to the user community that demonstrates that the various software uh, versions of devices work with the various software versions of infrastructure from the various suppliers. And we would actually have been at a higher number if we had not all been hit by Corona because testing was uh, put on hold due to that. So uh, that is the situation with, um, with uh, Tetra interoperability. It's trusted, it's always available and everywhere. And over to you, Brian, thank you. Thanks, Jeppe. So uh, I'm now gonna take a quick look at the Tetra standard. Well, what can I say about this? The first is it's big. And the first parts were released in 1996, which is quite a long time ago. It's, as you can see, an Etsy standard, um, and that helps to ensure its quality, I believe. It consists, as you can see, of 19 parts um, and defines, firstly, three Tetra interfaces. Uh, the air interface, which is the interface between the mobile terminals and base stations. Secondly, the peripheral equipment interface, uh, which connects other devices to mobile terminals. And lastly, but by no means least, the intersystems interface, which allows terminals to roam outside the area of their network to a visited network by, by prior agreement. It then goes on to define several functions and services. These, are, these really are numerous and include, uh, and I've just got a very small list here, the security functions, direct mode operation, including set to set gateway and repeater functions, the codec, the short data services, and a, and a host of others, as well as basic services. There are, oh, I've just got a notice say I'm getting network problems. As well as basic services, there are 69 specifications relating to supplementary services including some very important functions such as DGNA, dynamic group number assignment, used to temporarily assign terminals to groups for particular short-term operations. The standard at last count, and it does change quite frequently, consists of 142 current specifications and also 37 technical reports these include user requirements, specifications, designers, guides, and um, overall overviews of architecture, things like that. It's an open standard. And so all these documents are available free on the Etsy website, uh, the address shown. So just to go on to uh, ongoing developments of the Tetra standard, by that I mean, uh, stuff that's been done in the past since the release. Since its first release, Tetra has been enhanced, corrected and improved continually. Just a few of the earlier developments have changed Tetra from a largely voice-centric technology into a real voice plus data system. And some of these uh, uh, changes are shown, including multi-slot packet data, using all four time slots to increase data throughput. Originally, Tetra data was defined as circuit switch, but this has rapidly changed as IP overtook the world. SDS, our short data service, which is a bit similar to SMS or was, 
uh, was improved to carry all sorts of short messages and LIP, LIP, Locational Information Protocol, was developed to efficiently send location messages so that Tetra could be used for management of resources. The inter-system interface was originally defined using circuit switch bearers, and that's been extensively rewritten, a huge effort to allow IP bearers. Another point worth mentioning is in Europe, the conformance regulations have changed uh, twice now in the life of Tetra. So in order to put Tetra terminals and systems on the European market, it's had to have a harmonized conformance standard. And the latest one of these is largely complete, but it's still underway. And this is so that we can meet the requirements of the replacement European directive on testing of radio parameters. And that's called the radio equipment directive. You can see the, uh, the number there. One other development um, was the increasing use of air ground air communications meant that our previous limit of 58 kilometers uh, range from base station to terminal and back has now been extended to cater for this and also could be used in the case of rural cells where you want fewer cells in a low population density area but enough of the past i'd like to now hand over to dave chase lee to look at present day developments dave Thank you, Brian. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of developments that are ongoing in the Tetra standards right now. I'll talk about some of the packet data things that we're working on. I'll talk about security enhancements. And then I will talk about the work we're doing to ensure interoperability with the 3GPP developed mission critical applications. So if we could advance to the next slide, please, uh, Brian. little bit of a delay and catch up. Thank you. So Tetra Packet Data Service has been around for a while now, nearly 20 years, and its aim is to carry IP packet encapsulated data between either a mobile station and a fixed data host of some sort, which is the majority application, or indeed for mobile to mobile communication as well. But it is an individual service. The short data service that Brian mentioned already does support group address transmission for these much shorter pieces of data. So the goal of the group address packet data work is to do the same thing with packet data to allow a transmission a, or simultaneous transmission to a group of mobiles all at the same time. So that where you have multiple mobiles sitting under the coverage of a single base station, the information only needs to be sent once rather than multiple times. The concept of this is that although today we divide the packet data transmission up into what we call segments, where one segment is sent in each time slot that's transmitted, and each of those segments has forward error correction, our idea is to add on additional forward error correction acting on the entire message itself so that not only do you get individual segments of the message, you have additional redundancy transmitted as further repair segments following the stream of the main uh, data segments. What this allows a mobile to do is that if it's missed a time slot or even several time slots, it will be able to have enough repair information to reconstruct the transmitted uh, packet that was sent. So you're sending a slightly larger packet but you only need to send it once and it can be recovered with missing parts uh, recovered by all of the different mobiles in the group. It will be a little bit more complex than that in that if a mobile still doesn't have enough information to repair the packet that was sent, it can request more packets and the packet that's delivered is delivered to all mobiles. So not everybody needs to ask. Uh, one or two mobiles asking should provide enough repair for everybody. So it, it, but it will become an efficient service. And essentially, you should be able to send with a very high degree of reliability uh, enough information to send the to send information to a group of mobiles for less than the overhead of sending it twice. You know, it'd be about one and a half times to get a very very good uh, one and a half times the length of a single transmission to get a very good uh, error corrected service. In terms of protocols, one of the things about the Tetra service is that the IP devices 
mobile data terminals, fixed hosts and so on, should not need to know anything about Tetra. They should just be dealing with an IP service. And we will extend that concept into the group address service as well. So that if a data host sends a packet to a multicast IP address, that will then get translated and sent out to the relevant Tetra group of mobiles in the same way that a, a webcast such as this is disseminated. Protocol work is still in progress. It'll be a little time before we finish it, but it's something that we should have on the shelf for Tetra within the next year. You could say, is this too late? I mean, Tetra is a stable standard and the emphasis now of the public safety community is looking at the wider bandwidths of data that technologies like 3GPP LTE are offering. But what we have noticed is that although there was a lot of impetus to look at LTE as soon as it became available, in practice, the rollout of mission critical systems over LTE seems to be taking quite a lot longer than perhaps some of the biggest enthusiasts were predicting. And we can see a situation where, first of all, Tetra is going to be around for a long time. And we know of contracts going out into the mid 2030s. And secondly, depending on the model for deployment of LTE in different countries, whether it's privately funded, whether it's using a commercial operator and so on, it may be that the LTE coverage does simply not provide geographical nationwide coverage. And there becomes a mix of the MC systems over LTE and Tetra for the long term. So if we need Tetra to become part of a long term solution and data becomes more and more critical, then it's developments like this that will keep Tetra up to meeting the needs of the users. So that's the reason for this development. So that was what we were going to talk about as far as uh, data was concerned. I think the next thing I'd like to talk about, uh, if we could move on, please, Brian, are some security enhancements to the Tetra standard. And specifically, we're developing some new air interface encryption algorithms to sit together with the existing algorithm set. But their intention is that gradually over the next 10 years, they will take over and they will become the uh, algorithms that secure Tetra systems. The purpose of developing new algorithms is quite simply to have something with longer encryption keys, uh, because the threat to an encryption key, and I will talk about this in more detail on my next slide, but the threat to an encryption key becomes greater as technology advances and it becomes possible to, uh, for a, an adversary to attempt to find a key by brute force searching. A longer key clearly makes the search problem uh, longer. We've set ourselves the target of mitigating threats to the uh, process, encryption processes to at least 2040 and informally are looking a little beyond this to make sure that there is some margin sitting in there. The process will also need to uh, update the management mechanisms associated with different algorithms and keys, such as being able to change keys by over the air rekeying mechanisms. And finally, the work is also going to have to make sure that it's possible to transition a system from an existing algorithm to a new algorithm without having to switch off or throw everything away. So the ability to migrate between technologies or between algorithms is key to the work as well. We intend the standards and the algorithm development to be done sometime during 2022, which will be insufficient time to last Tetra out, as I say, for the next couple of decades. Where we are at the moment is within the TCCA security group, SFPG, the Security and Fraud Prevention Group. We're doing a lot of the background work to look at what the requirements are, how long the keys should be, and anything else determining uh, how an algorithm should be constructed and what's appropriate in the Tetra environment. So I'll just talk a little bit more detail about the, uh, about the purpose and the, of the work. So if we could move on to the next slide, please, Brian. <clears throat> So the whole idea of air interface encryption is to make the air interface, the radio link that anybody with an appropriate piece of radio equipment can try and eavesdrop on, is as hard to attack as, as or, or harder to attack even than other means of getting at the system. So it should be harder to technically analyze the air interface than it should be to try and gain access into the fixed network or to subvert somebody by bribing somebody, stealing equipment and so on. Now the key length, um, assuming the algorithm is a strong algorithm, the difficulty of attack of the algorithm can be considered to be the time it takes to brute force attack the key. So if you could just click the pointer once, please, Brian. 
And what a brute force attack means is you have a computer or other piece of dedicated hardware which can try every possible encryption key in turn until it successfully decrypts a piece of information. And then once you've found that key, you can then decrypt the rest of the information that's transmitted with it until that key is changed. Now, clearly, when we started, we had 80-bit keys. It was predicted it would take thousands and thousands and thousands of years with almost the fastest hardware imaginable to decrypt and crack an 80-bit key by trying every key in turn. The problem is, as everybody knows, every year computer hardware gets cheaper, memory gets cheaper, it's possible to buy more memory, faster processes and so on. So the amount of money the attacker would have to spend to try an increasing number of keys reduces. So where, where an attacker could spend, let's say, $100 million uh, 10 years ago, maybe today he only needs to spend $10 million, and then in 10 years' time he'll need to spend $1 million and so on. It, it's pretty much a factor of 10 over five years that we have to concern ourselves with. So although the 80-bit keys have been adequate so far and are still adequate at the moment, certainly it would take an awful lot of money to attack an 80-bit key within a realistic time frame. That will reduce as we go forwards. So now really is the time to push the problem back up again and simply invest in algorithms that have longer keys. You could take a sort of linear approach. So if I say an order of magnitude uh, reduction in cost every five years, then I just need to step back 20 or 25 years and put it up by the equivalent number of bits. But there is a, uh, a newer factor that we have to consider, and that's quantum computing. So if we just have the second animation, please. Quantum computing is a new science, and its ability to crack difficult problems is something we need to take into account. There are some algorithms based on public keys, and unfortunately, this is what internet security is based on. So every transaction between you and your bank and you and your website is protected by a form of public key security. Um, pub quantum computers, should they become realizable within the time frame that we are worried about, may become a very efficient way of uh, attacking those algorithms because of their ability to factor large numbers composed of prime numbers, which is the issue behind the public key uh, security mechanism. Now, the Tetra algorithms are not vulnerable to this sort of serious attack, the but the quantum computer can still speed up the number of keys it's able to test in a given time frame. And so whereas you might need a key of a particular length to attack with a conventional computer, you may need somewhere between one and a half and two times the length of key if you think a quantum computer is going to be realistic and a possible means of attacking the key. The quantum computer may or may not be a means of attack of a Tetra algorithm within the time frame we're interested in, but we're certainly not going to take any chances on this. So we're going to ensure that the algorithm key lengths are long enough to resist a quantum computer should it become practical within our design time frame. So that's really the piece of work that we're doing. And the purpose of this simply is to make sure that Tetra does remain secure, certainly going out through another 20 years and probably a fair distance beyond that as well, so that Tetra's security will meet the needs for the remainder of the technology's lifetime. And if indeed in 20 years time, we're finding Tetra is still in use and still needs to be extended further, then we can redo the calculations and work out whether we need to go through the exercise again because at least the standard has the flexibility to allow us to add additional algorithms as we need to do that. So that was what I wanted to talk about in terms of Tetra development. Uh, I'd now like to cover the subject of interworking between Tetra and the 3GPP mission critical systems, which is the other topic that we're working on within the working groups at the moment. Now, the background for this, as I'm sure everybody is familiar with, is that for the last few years, 3GPP have been standardizing a set of mission critical applications which are designed to work over LTE or indeed later technologies and standardization work in 3GPP is looking at the uh, aspects of the impact of 5G at the moment. It started off by just the speech service MCPTT which was completed in release uh, 13 in 2016 and since then has had video and data added and those services have been developed and extended and work is still ongoing to enhance the uh, mission critical standards. For example, uh, 
improving technologies like location is going on at the moment. One of the primary requirements though, as organizations migrate to first of all, take on 3GPP applications over LTE in addition to Tetra, and then in some cases looking at superseding Tetra with these technologies, it becomes important to have the new technology from the MC systems to work with the existing deployed Tetra technology. So 3GPP started working on their side of the interoperability specification a couple of years ago, and the release containing that protocols are, is being completed this month. Release 16 uh, brings the first release of interoperability to fruition. The services that are interoperable will be the speech service, that's MCPTT, and the short data service, MC data. Clearly, video services, interoperability with Tetra are not going to be practical because of the mismatch in available bit rates. And it's felt for, for the packet data services, as the majority of transactions are mobile to host, you can solve that within the host computer network and just have separate IP connections from MC and Tetra side. So we don't really need to consider packet data, but the important thing is speech and then also short data. So if we move on the slide, please, Brian. Uh, the facilities that we're looking on standardizing, and this is work that has been completed, probably and they'll still need a bit of development, but largely completed in 3GPP, and we're now working on in Tetra, are first of all, the ability to attach and join into calls in groups. And we need to look at both scenarios where Tetra users need to join a group that's defined on the MC side, but also MCPTT users need to join a group that's home on the Tetra side and to join in communications between both sets of users. We need to support the individual call, as we call it, or private call, as it's known in the MC side, between Tetra users and MCPTT users. And clearly, emergency calls are very important as well. So we will need to support emergency group calls and emergency individual calls. And then finally, short data messages will need to go from Tetra to MC side, MC side to Tetra side, and clearly we need to be able to send a short data message from one system to a group in the other system, or indeed to a group that is encompassing both systems so that we maintain parity with the services that we have on Tetra today. And finally, encryption is important as well. So we need to protect the security of communications and indeed for the users that care most about security, allow end-to-end -end encryption to operate right from a Tetra handset on one side through the network to a, a 3GPP defined mission critical user equipment on the other side. So those are the facilities that we're looking at uh, adopting. If we move to the next slide, uh, I've put a slide up which shows the reference model of the solution and also to try and explain where the standards stop and start. So 3GPP wanted to define a single solution for any technology remembering that in different parts of the world, they need to work with Tetra. In North America and some other places, they need to work with P25 technology. And there probably will be other technologies further along the road that need to be communicated with as well. So 3GPP wanted to have a single interworking interface and defined an interface con consisting of these three notional reference points called IWF 1, 2, and 3, which is simply the voice call protocol, the data call protocol, and the management protocol, that's essentially what these three are, to an, to an element that's called the interworking function. 3GPP specifically don't say what the interworking function does or how it's built. What they want to look at is what protocols you should send to it and what responses you get back from it. And in that way, it can be made generic as far as they're concerned. And from the 3GPP side, where you have a server sitting in the system processing speech calls, the thing that's called the MCPTT server, what it wants to be doing is talking to something that looks as much like another MCPTT server as possible. And the IWF interfaces are constructed in that way to make it look as close to being MCPTT system to MCPTT system as possible. If we then move over to the Tetra side, which is the work we are doing within Etsy TCCE right now, we need to look at that interface and then work out how that can plug into a Tetra system to make calls operate end to end. So what we've decided to do 
is make is will adopt the 3GPP interface as the formal interface coming into a Tetra system. So this will add to the mobile to base station interface and the inter-system interface and the peripheral equipment interface that Brian said earlier with the existing three main interfaces in Tetra. So we'll pick up the 3GPP specified interworking interface as our fourth main interface. And then what we will standardize is the behavior that a Tetra mobile will see when it's talking to a mobile on the 3GPP system. And essentially from the mobile's point of view, it's going to think it's talking to another Tetra mobile where that Tetra mobile is located in a different Tetra system via ISI. And the way, the reason for doing that is it changes the mobile as little as possible. And we believe probably not at all, because if we can make the translation occur within this notional interworking function, then the mobile itself, so long as it can handle communication with mobiles in other systems where there are ISIs involved, won't need any changes. And by doing that, you solve the problem of cost and the, sol and the problem of migration of a mobile using existing Tetra technology to one that needs to interwork with 3GPP. In the same way, of course, a user on the MC side need not know anything about Tetra. And as far as the MC user is concerned, he's communicating with a user or group in another MC system. And the interworking function sort of takes the complexity out and uh, manages that transition between the two, that translation, if you like. This will mean that amongst the things the interworking function has to do is managing the security and in the majority case, translating the speech coding so that 3GPP use their speech codec up to the interface. Tetra continues to use the ACALP speech codec on the Tetra side. And so that function will be taken uh, care of in the IWF. The model clearly we specify is a single interface, but that can be an instance of multiple interfaces. And if you look on the right hand side, any deployment model of a Tetra system talking to multiple MC systems or an MC system talking to multiple Tetra systems or indeed multiple of each types of system talking together will be supported. There'll, there'll be no constraints on the deployment as far as the standard is concerned. I'd just like to have, show one more slide uh, on security. Uh, if we could advance the next slide, please, Brian, because as I said, that is one of the things that is important, uh, particularly in the mission critical world. So the authentication side is carried out differently on each system and we'll just have to keep the authentication to validity within the system and ensure that validity in one system has sufficient trust to be trusted in the other system. 3GPP have defined a security gateway function which, uh, is, which will terminate their defined security mechanisms and then within the Tetra system clearly we have air interface encryption that will protect uh, information carried out to a mobile we will also allow a Tetra mobile to use Tetra end-to-end -end encryption as far as this interworking interface and then have the security translated, if you like, to 3GPP security. So that's a second option in there. But also we want to support the final option, the lowest part of this slide, which does allow the MCUE to talk fully end-to-end -end securely to the Tetra mobile. In this case, the MC device does need to understand a little bit about Tetra because it will have to support the Tetra vocoder and the Tetra security mechanisms. But given that constraint, then fully end-to-end -end solution will be possible. If we just go on to my final slide on interworking, uh, please, Brian, which is the next slide. Just to show where we are right now, we've already published two technical reports which examine the problem. Uh, we published the study on interworking, which looked at the services possible and how the solution might work in 2017. And then we published a technical report looking at the security issues in 2018. We have a specification that we're partway through developing at the moment. And the number there is there, 19392 part 19, part one. And our goal is to complete within the working group during this year. But as with all standardization activities, we are dependent on voluntary contributions. So at this point, I can't say for sure whether we'll meet that goal or not. Assuming we're successful, though, the publication of the standard should take place at some point during next year, perhaps towards the end of next year. Uh, we are or have been dependent on the 3GPP release. That's now 
complete and frozen, which is good. But what we would actually expect to find in practice that as we are delving deeper into aspects of the protocol, you find corner cases that then need some adaptation in both standards. So it's quite likely the change requests will need to follow on top of that. The other piece of the puzzle is if we do want the end-to-end -end security to work all the way through to the NC side, is we need to standardize the means of encapsulating Tetris speech in a way it can be carried on the other side. And we completed that work last year. And the Internet Authority um, recognition, the IANA, the Numbering Authority, has already published the format of this transport, which allows media to be carried on the 3GPP side. So that piece of the puzzle is there. So that concludes what I had to say on interworking, and I'll pass it back to you, Brian. Thank you very much, Dave. And just finally, some conclusions. So, sorry, I need to go back on that. Uh, Tetra has proved itself to be the go-to technology for critical communications users over the past 25 years. Um, it's been continually developed and still has very, very good industry support, as Yepa stated earlier. The ongoing developments mean it's future-proofed and enjoys users' confidence in its longevity. As you've just heard from Dave, interworking with mission-critical broadband systems will be extremely important over the medium term to enable users to retain their Tetra systems for as long as they need to migrate wholly or or partly to broadband. And also, many users do not need broadband services. So Tetra remains their choice of technology for mission critical systems. Looking to the future, um, I think as Dave has also pointed out, as well as work going on within uh, Etsy TCCE, 3GPP, um, a lot of very active TCCA working groups, including TF, SSPG, CCBG, and others uh, who are going to remain nameless, I'm afraid, uh, are there to ensure and have been working to ensure that users have the most relevant mission critical systems available to them. As you heard from Yepa, Tetra is still showing very, very good sales growth in many different verticals. So its future seems, as the advert once went, as bright as ever. Tetra shows every sign of still being in use and still under development well into the end of the next decade. And with that, uh, that's the end of the presentation. So thank you very much. Tony. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for a very interesting and informative presentation. Actually, whilst listening, I was recalling that TCCA published a roadmap a year or so ago, showing how we expect the gradual migration from narrowband to broadband mission critical services to happen over a number of years into the future. I think you can agree that everything we've just heard demonstrates that Tetra will indeed remain fit for purpose in the intervening however many years, and it's certainly going to be with us, as the title says, to 2035 and beyond. <clears throat> 